Hello, screenwriters, and welcome to Writing for Screens, the screenwriting step-by-step -step project. Episode 224, my name is Glenn Gers, and I come to you every Monday through Friday, if I can make it, at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time Zone to let you look over my shoulder, share my screen as I write a script. I am doing this in order to teach a part of script writing that I think is undertaught, which is just the process, the, the mechanical, daily, step-by-step, line-by-line process of getting your thoughts into an outline, into a rough draft, into a polished draft. The way that anything gets written, a rom-com, a sci-fi rom epic, a thriller series, they're all still things in script form. And the process of doing that is a kind of mechanical, kind of technical, kind of something that I had to teach myself in my 25-year career writing for TV and movies. So I thought on my way out of the business, I would show it to you in case some of the tips and tricks and techniques and tools that I had to figure out for myself are useful to you. If they are, take them. If they're not, don't, because only you know what's good for you. And every writer has to figure out their own process. But the way you figure that out is by seeing how other people do it, by trying things out. So I'm just trying to let you do that in case it's helpful when you are looking at the blank page. The main thing that I do here that I think is helpful is actually on my channel. The other playlists, the first three playlists on my channel, Screenwriting Essentials, Screenwriting Tools, Skills, and Craft, and The Process, Being a Writer. That's where I put everything I can think of to try and teach screenwriting into little 10-minute lesson videos. They're just 10 minutes of the purest, simplest, clearest version I could figure out of what I know about screenwriting. And they are there for you whenever you want. They are there for free. Just check them out. Each one has its own topic, like genre, dramatic action, flashbacks, whatever it is. I tried to give you 10 minutes worth of goodies, and I hope you'll check that out, because that's really where what I have to teach is. Hello, Butte and Chat. Hello, Nathan. Good to see you. Hi, Larry. It is nice to have a bunch of people here while I do this, because we are we are now moving through this, this process. Uh, I am polishing up the draft. I am taking the, the script draft that I... Uh, I'm opening up the document now in case you're wondering if for some reason my computer is slow. There we go. Um, I am going through the draft page by page. Uh, we are now almost halfway through. By the end of today, we will have hit the halfway point of getting this to be a readable script. Um, and that's the goal. <laughs> so um, the, the the nice part about the section that we're in is that it's in good shape. So we're going to move fast. Um, so this, uh, this scene, uh, Madeline is stoned out of her mind. Norman is trying to get her uh, safely to bed. So he is walking with her, her arm is over his shoulder. And um, and actually this entire scene, uh, I just reread it before uh, we went live and it's in great shape. Um, a couple of words here and there that I might fool with, but honestly, it's good. Uh, so she says, I'm not usually like this. He says, what are you usually like? By the way, distracted, trying to figure out how to turn her so she doesn't flop down face first onto the bed. That is a... <sighs> Flap down on the bed face first. There we go. Just a little less words and put the face first at the end of the sentence to give it more. more. Whatever's at the end of your line, the end of a sentence, tends to be the the, the punchline, the kicker, the, the, the strongest part. Um, you kind of open strong, distracted, um, but then um, trying to figure out how to turn her, turn so her, so she doesn't just flop down on the bed face first. So, distracted, what are you usually like? I'm dishwasher safe. Uh-huh. All right. Let's just get you turned. Turning. All right. Ooh, dangerous maneuver. He's back here up to the bed. And yet you can say the word maneuver. This it. All right. With an ungrateful... Uh, this is too this is too formal sounding they sit ungracefully gracelessly clumsily clumsily
Okay, this is one of those things where it's really wordy, but I think I need to leave it. He's still got one arm around her waist, the other hand gripping her wrist, which is around his shoulders. That's that's just the facts. I cannot figure out a way to make that shorter. Um, okay. You know, I didn't think I'd spend my summer learning how to screenwrite, but... I'm not mad. Good. I'm glad, Edison Gray. It is nice. It is nice to find that you are learning. That gives me a reason to be here. <laughs> uh, learning, you you guys learning is my is my raison d'être, my reason to be. Okay. Uh, this dialogue is excellent. I'm going to let go of you now. Are you out of your freaking mind? You're safe. Dishwasher. He's saying something that she said, which is meaningless to him, but so, no, no, no. If you let go, I will instantly go, go, go. I don't like go. If you let go, I will instantly whirl off into, fly, fly, whirl off into space. Whirl. Whirl off into outer space. If you let go, I will instantly whirl off into outer space. I swear that you won't. Really? Has any part of today been what you thought would happen? Bested logically, Norman tries to figure out the next maneuver. Now, is that spelled right? Because, yeah, I guess it is. Uh, still, say, it's still holding, I don't need to say. There we go. Okay, scooch, back, like this. She wriggles back, making the truck back amp sound. Please don't. <laughs> and then they're falling back. Falling. Falling backward. <sighs> um... Falling, slipping, tilting, and there. Nah. Okay. Good breathless. Nah. Too many words. Back. Okay. Um, hmm. Okay. Oh, it says my internet connection is bad and that you are getting a bad stream. If that's true, I apologize. Um, hey, RJQ, glad you can make it. Um, welcome, even though you have a terrifying icon, uh, you know, a uh, picture there, whatever. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. And then they're falling back onto the pillows, Norman. Leaning her back, tipping back. Yeah, not bad. Um, oh, good. I am glad. You just can't trust these softwares, huh? They, they tell you things that aren't true or aren't visible. They might be true. It might be technologically true. But as long as you guys are okay, I'm okay. You know, sometimes you leave things a little descriptive and then they're falling back onto the pillows. Norman's arm's still around her. Okay, good news. Starts to try to accuracy. She snores. Starts to try to. Starts to extricate himself. But she snores again. Eyes shut, relaxed. Dead weight on his arm. Oh no. No, seriously. He tries to move. It is. It is nice. <laughs> and 
she snores again with eyes shut. Relaxed. Dead widow. That's better. Um, so what would happen if the main character died? Is that a trolley question? It feels trolley. Um, obviously, if the main character died, the story would be over, and that would be abrupt. Hey, Jean, um, if that's a serious question, uh, let me know, and I will try to discuss why you would have the main character die halfway through the pilot episode. <laughs> uh, all right, or why you wouldn't, because then they wouldn't be the main character. Secret. That's a tip. That's a professional tip. If your main character dies in the halfway through the pilot episode of a show and doesn't appear anymore, they are not the main character. Uh, all right. Beat. Is that a beat? No. There, that's better. All right. Um, dead weight on his arm. No, 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 seriously. Okay. Do I want to? This is too much. Either he gives up or he sighs. Well, let's look at it both ways. He gives up. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. OK. So this scene is done. And um, and all, the only thing I was I wasn't changing the dialogue at all. The dialogue was right, um, except for that whirling, go whirling. Ah, falling bothers me. Tipping. <sighs> okay, that's good. That's good. We did it. Matching. to get out to Georgia's I'm taking the red eye note. There we go. Norman Norman showed up and he thought, don't ask about a lava lamp. <laughs> That's a good line. Taking the red eye. I have to get to George get out to George. George's taking the red I'm taking the red eye moment. Don't know. Don't know. No time. I need you to do something. Focus. I need you to do something. <laughs> Why? Focus, I need you to do something. Why? Focus, I need you to do something. Don't care. Okay, I'm on it. What is it? I'm here. I'm on it. What? What is it? 
Um, I think that this is playable. It's not my favorite dialogue, but it's not bad. Um, I think I think when you I have to get out to Georgia's taking taking the red eye taking the red eye. I don't like the I'm I'm taking the red eye. Have to get out. Also. Taking the red eye, it's, I don't know, is Xena the sort of person who flies? I, red eye, it's a fairly common phrase. It means the overnight flight from the West Coast to the East Coast. Um, red eye, as in, because of the time difference, you basically leave at 9 or 10 o'clock, you get there at 5 or 6 in the morning, you have had no night, you have red eyes. Uh, okay. I have to get out to George's. Taking the red eye, Norman showed up at... Uh, are you serious? Why? Focus, I need you to do something. <laughs> that's that's actually pretty funny. I'm on it. Okay, I'm on it. Okay, okay, I'm on it. I'm here. Okay, I'm here. What can I do? What can I do? Okay, I'm here. What can I? Okay, I'm here. 30th anniversary. I need you to go to that for me. Tell them I can't make it. You're there instead. <laughs> Gonna be okay. What are they gonna do? Fire me? It's fancy, right? Do they have a problem with it? Do they have a problem with gender fluidity? I wouldn't bring it up. Gotcha. One other thing, you need to sing a song. No way, sorry. You're not a singer, right? I'm working on that. Into the deep end. Boom, a star is born. I can't. You have to. It's my gift to them my gift to them and my gift and my gift to you this is brilliant. look how brilliant this is look how how genius this is it's my gift to them and yeah, this is good you have to look how genius this is it's my gift to them and my gift to you you can do this Give them one of the ways your phone and have them video. I want. I want to see it. Have them video from me. You can do this. You're great. You're great. There we go. Give give the waiter your phone. Give the waiter. Yeah, just give the waiter your phone. And the video for me. What kind of song? There we go. Okay, yeah. Because I, I want camera. This is here. Here. This is um, this is a key thing. Okay. In this this scene, w when you're writing a scene, you want to end it with with something that that tells the audience this is done. This is over. So the point is. Um, We've got this scene where, where, um, you know what, um, Cameron, this scene where Zena is on her way out and she's throwing instructions at Cameron. Um, um, uh, okay, so, so Zena, it starts, the scene starts with a, a situation. Zena is leaving. She is on the move, um, and she is throwing instructions at Cameron. And Cameron is doing everything she can to be a good soldier. Um, Zena is asking something outrageous, <laughs> and Cameron is a little scared of that. She's now being plunged into something she's not sure is a good idea. But she is a good soldier. She wants to please Zena, um, and so. She accepts everything. Like she, she brings up the problems that she can see, and accepts the instructions, the answer until the song, and then she's uh, then the scene, uh, like it's gone boom, boom, boom. Order, order, order. Okay, okay, okay. Song, boom. Okay, now the scene has a structure. The shit, Zena has pushed too far, um, and Cameron then um, is 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 resisting, and then Zena. Pulls it out. She, we find this is a revelation of how Zena works. The truth is, Zena is right. It is a gift 
to both parties. It is a special thing for the parents, a weird special thing, but still a special thing, because she honestly does believe that Cameron will do well. And it's a gift to Cameron because Cameron needs to be pushed to perform. So the cool thing about this is that just when it looks like this whole section is like, okay, we've hit a point where Xena has has gone too far in her self-centeredness. And then it turns out that Xena, because the thing we need to know about Xena is that, um, uh, sorry, I got distracted by the chat. Um, the thing that we know need to know about Xena is she operates by making people feel like she's their helper. She's their best pal. She's their sidekick. She never take, even though she is actually taking center stage, she makes it seem like she's doing it for someone else every time. That is her game. Um, and the cool thing is it works. There's a moment of silence where Cameron is making a decision. And then she says, what kind of song? In other words, yes, I am in. So that is why this scene has a shape. And I just want to point out to you what the shape of a scene is, is that it starts with an interesting situation, and then there's a, a twist, a problem, uh, an obstacle, and then somebody does something which adjusts it, moves past the apparent problem to A, solve the problem, and B, reveal something to us. That's, that's what a scene is all about. Okay, um, very briefly... Hello, <laughs> hi Donna, in your two different identities. Well played with the switching. Um, hello, hello. Okay. Meanwhile, Matthew. Hi, Glenn. I get that some studios don't accept unsolicited scripts. All studios don't accept unsolicited scripts um, because they don't want to be sued for copying material. But doesn't a release form so I get around this problem? Ah, now here's the thing. They are saying they don't accept scripts because of copying copyrighted material. Um, that's what they're saying. <laughs> and yes, a release form signed by the writer would do that. And it would have to be their release form. In other words, you can't send your release form. It needs to be from their legal department that fits what they legally are worried about. And so, yes, if they really wanted to do it, they would send you a release form and do it. But the truth is they are using the we don't accept unsolicited scripts for copyright problems, for, for legal problems, as a way to keep from reading unsolicited scripts, because I can, I, this is really true. 99% of unsolicited scripts are awful. <laughs> they're, they're really, really, really bad. And, um, and that's just the nature of, of any creative art. If you've got most people who are doing it are not going to be at a professional level. That is the point of professional art. It's the, it's the cream of the crop. It is the top level. And you need to have established that you are at that level by one of the ways by which people do that, which is usually you get an agent or a manager um, or some form of representative whose job it is to read scripts and say, ah, this one, no, this one, yes. When they've said yes, they have pre-screened the, um, the, the, the mass, what it's called the, the sludge pile. <laughs> it's called, <laughs> that's what it's called. Um, the, the, there's a, every agent, manager, studio, company, person in the world gets a pile of people saying, hey, read my script. Most of those scripts are not good enough. Um, uh, let's put it this way. Most of the scripts they're going to read from professionals are not good enough. You know, okay, they're only going to want 1% of the scripts they are reading from agents. So can you imagine, and that's, okay, that's the top, five to 10% of all scripts in existence. So if you start put the other 90 to 95% into that pile too, it would simply be overwhelming. Um, now and then you will get an agency or a, a person, a company that says, we're going to assign a, a, a low level person to wade through the slush pile. That's what it's called, the slush pile. Um, slush pile means scripts that came in from just anybody. And somebody has to read them. And now and then, of course, there will be something really good. But there is no way that they could know this unless they actually have someone read all of them. And because of that, that's a lot of work. You have to pay someone to do that. Um, and honestly, why? Why not wait until you get a reference to somebody? Like the reason that they read a script is because somebody 
has, for whatever their reason, because it's their nephew or because it's somebody that they met at a school or at a contest or, or for whatever reason, someone got a chance to read a script and recognized it was good. And um, so then they will give, to, you know, the agent will say, okay, I will read this because my actor friend told me it's good. And so therefore I will read it. Um, that's how they do it. That's how it is done, which is why you should try to give your script to everyone you can. First of all, you should give your scripts to everyone who wants to read it because you wrote it to be read. Why not? But you also never know. Um, famously, um, uh, Reservoir Dogs. Um, Reservoir Dogs, Tarantino was tired of being unable to get his movies produced. He was actually, I think, a professional writer at that point, but he couldn't get them produced. So he wrote Reservoir Dogs, essentially planning to do it himself, ultra low budget. And his producer, his wannabe producer friend, his beginning producer friend, Lawrence Bender, said, give me a little while to see if I can set it up with a real company for real money. And the way that he did it, I believe, is that he or someone he knew was in a yoga class with Harvey Keitel or someone that Harvey Keitel knew. And he basically got the script to Keitel and said, and through a person who knew a person who knew a person. And, um, and Keitel read it and, of course, recognized that it was good writing and a good story. And, well, it was just ready. It was good. And so Keitel signed on. And then they could take that because Keitel could then give it to his agent and say, hey, you know, get this guy an agent and send it around, whatever. So that's how it often happens. I am sorry to tell you that because it's a grim, uh, apparently grim story. But the truth is there are too many scripts for too few places. That's the fact. So um, the, the best thing, as I've said often, and I will continue to say, the, thing, the best thing for you to do is keep writing more scripts and keep showing them to more people and keep getting better. Because the truth is, even if you are talented, even if you are good, you still need to write a bunch of scripts to get better. And you need to have experiences and you need to have feedback and you need to get, you need to fail and learn. And so that is what you need to do. And if during that process you get lucky and someone reads it, and I know there's a lot of you out there who don't know anyone, et cetera, et cetera. My advice is try to submit to film festivals and some of the more than film contests, film festivals that have screenwriting contests within them are at least a little more interested in finding talent. Contests, honestly, it's, it's OK. Uh, to the extent that you can afford to enter contests and festivals uh, and, and if you can show it to someone who's in the business or knows someone in the business. Honestly, the way that I got my first <laughs> agent was because uh, someone I knew knew someone who was in the film business and they said, would you read my friend's script? And they said yes. And they gave it to another person who gave it to another person who eventually knew an agent and, they, and, and the agent was interested. That's how it happened for me. Now, admittedly, this was 50 years ago and it was in New York City. And if you're not in New York City, it's harder um, if you're not in, in one of the major film places. But honestly, every place you are, there's going to be uh, college classes, the, the film classes. Will they? Will the professor help you? Probably not, but you never know. You take it. But there's also local TV stations, local product theater companies. You never know who you will meet doing work. That's the key. Go to where you can do the work at the level you can get in. If you can just work in a theater, if you can work in a local theater, if you can be an intern at a local film festival, you never know who you will meet. Don't go handing everyone your script without asking, but but do recognize that that's a lucky break. And then submit to every contest you know. Okay. Um, let me scroll down and see what I've missed in the... Uh, okay. All right. Ba, 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 ba. So let me uh, do a couple other questions. How do you write dialogue where characters are in different locations? Or i.e. over radio, how do you set up the slug lines? Phil J, you came to the right place because I am writing a scene like that right now. This scene, there's two characters, okay? So let's look at this. This is a phone call, um, which is like over radio. Um, this is the same thing. So the way I do it, there are many people do it different ways, but this is the way I do it. You have your slug line for... 
Location one, the per Zena is in her half of the scene. You're going to intercut between her and camera. So Zena's house night. Then I describe Zena, what she is doing, and she is talking into her ear pods. And then I write intercut, which means that slug line scene and this slug line scene are intercut. So if people are talking from now on, as they are, camera and Zena, it means that the uh, production has the option to be on Zena or on Cameron because they filmed the entire scene both ways, like on both sides. They filmed Zena's whole half of the dialogue and they filmed Cameron's whole half of the dialogue. They'll decide in editing where they want to be on who, but that's how you do it so that you don't have to do the slug lines back and forth every single time they exchange dialogue because otherwise you'd have to put Zena's house before every Zena line. Zena's house here, and then Zena's house here. That's impossible to read. So that's what this thing intercut is for. Does that help you, Phil J? Um, okay. So boo, boo, boo. let's see the next question. Edison Gray has a low-key off-topic. Used to writing stories, more descriptive. Is screenwriting kind of like that, but less data held? Yes, that is exactly what it is like. Um, you you just want to basically you want to only describe the almost literally the minimum. <laughs> you want, you only want to. It's not that you only describe what you can see or hear. It's that you only want to describe what will keep the story moving. So, for instance, here all I am trying to say is Zena hurries out to a waiting Uber, pulling her matching suitcase and carrying because I want to say she is going to the airport and she has her and I want to point out that she's got fancy luggage. Um, and then talking into her earpods because I have to establish that this is going to be a phone conversation. So that's it. Three actions described. Hurries out to a waiting Uber, pulling her matching luggage, talking into her earpods. That's all I really need. Now, we have already described Zena earlier, so I don't have to keep describing what she's wearing. It's not important. Um, if you describe what she's wearing, that can be fun, but your script, like this script is already a little long, but all scripts are always <laughs> long. And so what you want to do is think, okay, we know who Xena is. We don't need to know whether she's wearing a, a jumpsuit or, 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 you know, stretch jeans. That's not important. It, it may be interesting and in the final production it will happen. But what you're reading for when you read a script is the story. You are reading the characters and the actions they are taking, what they are doing and what they are feeling. So you want to be able to make the read go as fast as you can with that and not describing everything, which otherwise, if this was a story, you would probably describe this more. In fact, I am going to... Um, doing homework. Um, sprawled on her bed, uh, on their bed. Sorry, there. Um, okay. So, um, and I, the reason I'm saying is doing homework is just to remind people, because we haven't seen Cameron that much, that Cameron is a high school student. Um, so, uh, so that's, does that help you, um, Edison Gray? Do you, uh, do you get the, the message here, which is yes, now and then, if you describe something, it usually has to be important because it reveals something about that moment or is going to be involved in the action. Like earlier, I describe um, a, a, a character dancing and singing um, to a recording with a made-up pretend microphone, and I say, lit only by a lava lamp. Now, I'm doing that partly because that lava lamp is going to be a prop in the fight that's going to happen in the next scene. So by I'm establishing the lava lamp. I could just say there is a lava lamp, but you try and blend it all into following what the people are doing. That is the key to how much description to write. Um, I also did in a separate uh, Ask Me Anything um, uh, talk about how much to describe characters and how much to describe action. It's two separate AMAs, Ask Me Anythings. Um, I will put the links to those AMAAs in the description of this episode after this episode is done. I can't do it now because I'm busy. I'm talking. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, 
Don't apologize, Donna. That was it was nice. Um, great, good. You got it, Phil. Excellent. Um, yeah, it, it, not unneeded descriptive words. Definitely not anybody's favorite thing to read when they are reading a script. They are reading for the characters and the story. Now, you do want to describe to keep the characters in the story alive and interesting. But you, like I said, usually that's something that is pretty simple. Okay? Like I'm not describing what the lights are like or even what the, their room is like. Um, okay. All right. Um, hi, Malika. Uh, I caught the tail end of your intercut. Ex ex use when, yes, exactly. When characters are in two different locations, so that they're on the phone or on the radio or any time that you are going back and forth between two places, even if it's just you're showing what's happening in, like, famously, you know, uh, someone is tied to a railroad track and the other person is racing towards them on a motorcycle trying to get to them before the train comes, you just intercut. Um, you can, if you want. Um, Okie dokie. Okay. Here we go. Good. So that scene is done. Look at that. We are racing on. Okay, now this, ah, Ah, Edison, this Edison Gray. This is uh, a, an example of I have, I am doing an ex. This whole scene is just one sentence of pure description. Night begins to retreat as sunrise warms the sky in the east and paints the front of George's shabby house. Um, what I am uh, trying to do is basically introduce the idea that this is a wonderful romantic scene that we are about to, but what I'm all I all I need to actually accomplish is, hey, we're at the outside of the house. Sun is coming up. <laughs> um, so all I could essentially do is say exterior George's house dawn and just say the sun is coming up. But I want to be a little fancy. And um, you know what? I'm going to. Let's just take this though. Boom. Uh, there we go. Okay, night begins to retreat as sunrise paints the front of Georgia's house orange and pink. Uh, that's that's also good. Um, yeah, I kind of like that. Um, Pale light edges around the window shades. Norman and Madeline sleep. She still nestles against his chest. So this is very descriptive. So this is a chance for you to see. The reason this is descriptive is they're not talking. <laughs> this is going to be a scene where they, they say very little for a while. Um, she still nestles against his chest. His arm is still around her shoulders. She opens one eye. Her mouth feels like carpeting. And what exactly is she lying on? So the point is, at this point, I'm not describing, I, or I am, I'm describing action, describing how she feels, describing what she does. Um, likewise. Uh, so, um, and this is, by the way, uh, something that they, you know, some people say you can't do this. You can't um, say what she's feeling like or what she's thinking, because that... And what exactly is she lying on? We, that's in her mind. Um, but my point is, you can sh tell the reader this because the actor will then act it and the, the audience will understand it. So therefore, you are writing something that can be played and that's legit. You're allowed. You know what? I'm going to, this is a little, there we go. Since I've said that the uh, sunrise paints the front of the house orange and pink, I don't think we need to say that it's coming around the edge, especially because uh, light. There. Um, I, I established the light out the windows now. Um, and now the point about this is that I want to say they stare at each other. Now, it could just be, I could just say, they stare at each other. However, 
Um, I kind of like giving it a little bit of romance. Um, likewise, this is Madeline's eyes widen as it all, well, some, comes flooding back. In other words, she was stoned out of her mind. She did not know that she passed out on sleeping on him. Now she's beginning to remember. Her memory is fuzzy. So that's what I'm establishing here. She is remembering fuzzily. Um, and since Norman is going to watch her and he could be feeling many things, I am mentioning the things that I believe he is feeling. Okay. Okay, A.K. Sloth, uh, I'm going to let you uh, stay for a while, but... Uh, oh, wait. <laughs> A.K. Sloth, you're asking a serious question. I thought this was a troll question. Um, you mean what sounds better, like a fly, like as in the, the, the witch was attended by a team of flying snakes or flying donkeys? I would say snakes... But it depends uh, if you're saying sounds better as because a flying donkey could be sound better if it is referring to a uh, comical, sweet thing. I think of a flying donkey as kind of cute. Flying snake is kind of creepy. So sounds better. I am assuming you're meaning what is sound, literally like what seems better in the scene. If you're just trolling me, well, you got a serious answer. Um, okay. How do you decide when to punch up your description and be fancy and flowery and when you should not? That is by instinct. That is, how do you decide? You decide by your feelings. <laughs> you decide partly by your experience. Like I've done this many, many times, so I have a good sense of how much I can get away with. However, on a different day, as you can see, I will think differently. Some days I think, oh, I need a lot of description. And other days I'm like, nah, that's overkill. Um, that's why I personally believe that the best thing you should do is, uh, let's let me let me just take a second here to go over it and over it and over it. Here's the deal. If you do this, if you go over it and over it and over it, in other words, if you keep coming back doing drafts, doing doing passes as I've as I've said they are often called in the business, where you say, okay, I'm just going to reread this scene and see what I think about it. And then next week I do that. Every time you look at it, you are slightly different. It's been a different day. You've been watching different things. So therefore your brain is set differently and it registers things differently. And therefore, if 40 times you go through this scene and 30 of those times you think, I want this to be really descriptive then that'll win. If uh, if you find yourself going over it and over and over it, um, it begins to refine itself into what it is b most likely should be. The real answer is how do you describe, how do you decide, is you decide by instinct, by by your choice about what kind of of artist you want to be and what kind of feelings you want to have and what you're willing to gamble on. Like you're essentially gambling that the audience will get the picture and not feel bored. You're gambling that they will not be distracted. You are gambling that that it will entertain them and, and entrance them. You're saying, I bet that's how this is going to work. That's all you can do as an artist. So I would urge you to watch my uh, video on this, which is called Instinct. And that's exactly what it is. How do you decide? You decide partly by all the other things you've read. Like if you've read a hundred scripts, you'll have a better sense of, of what kind of things you can get away with and what kind of things are too much. So reading a huge amount, watching a huge amount of shows or movies like the one you want to do, that's how you develop your instinct and then practice doing it. The more you do it and show it to people and you find some sort of, if a lot of people are reading your stuff and saying, it got kind of boring, you know, I, I wasn't that interested, you probably need to move faster. If somebody's saying, I, I kind of wish that I saw, you know, like that you describe more, then there you go. Hey, Tavana, how you doing? It has been a long time. I'm hoping you are doing okay. Uh, great to see you. Very, very glad you are here. Um, we are just talking about artistic instincts and choices. Um, and as you're seeing, like in this, the reason I'm going over this for like the fourth or fifth time, 
and I am deciding that these lines, while good, are a little overly descriptive. And as such, they are keeping us away from the story, from the feelings of the characters. That's your priority, I believe. Okay. Um, so now, in this case, I am piling on the adjectives, trying to calculate her proportions of amusement, shape, gratitude, and uncertainty. Um, because what I'm trying to point out is that there is a mixture of these feelings, and it will be up to the actor in the moment to play that the way they want, the way their instinct, their instinct goes, because that is the truth about screenwriting. You are setting up your instincts to give them the material to play on their instincts. The actor is going to work on instinct. That's what they do. That's what good acting is. And you can't control what they're going to do, and you shouldn't be trying to. So I am, in some cases, offering them a lot of feelings because the whole point of this scene is there are a lot of feelings. In a lot of other scenes, I would not do that. In fact, this is a very rare thing, but I am doing it because this scene is so emotionally complex in its silence. So, does that make sense? I think it does. Oh, my breath. So, no, wait, hold on. Oh, my breath. No, what? No, I just, you don't want to. Oh, no, no, I do. Oh, no, I do. I just need consent. <laughs> um, so, okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's tricky. It's tricky to figure out how to write a deeply emotional and, and twisty scene when nobody's talking. But in fact, those scenes can play really well if you have specific actions planned, even though they are complex and silent. Um, and if you, if you look at this, you will see that the reason I feel confident about this is that in these, each one of these steps is a small playable action. First, they're sleeping and, and they're in a certain position, which tells you that they have not moved over all night. Then... This is a paragraph just about her slowly waking, him waking. Then the moment when they are awake, both aware of their intimacy in this romantic, intimate setting. Then she's remembering. He's, he, know, he remembers better than she does, so he is trying to see how she feels. Um, she is processing. That, you know, so each of these paragraphs has a simple verb, okay? Um, if you do not know what I mean by a verb, this video, dramatic action, key, key. Hold on, I have to write down. Dramatic action instinct. Okay, uh, just, I, I like to link those at the end of this. Uh, I will go into the description of this video and, and put links to these videos. Anyway, the point is each one of these uh, has an, a verb, okay? He's waking. They are staring at each other. They are, they are taking each other in. Um, she is remembering. He is trying to understand what she's feeling. He is, you know, you, you can find different verbs for that. He is watching. He is waiting. He is judging. I don't know. There's a lot of things. And then she is processing. She's trying to figure out what she feels. And then she takes an action. She says, no, don't talk. And then he goes silent. He's like, okay, where are we headed? And then she makes a move. She says, and I don't mean makes a move. Ooh. I mean, she takes, she says, essentially, the reason I wanted you to be silent is I am feeling loving. I am feeling romantic in this moment. And so she is, after all of this earlier questioning and processing, she is saying, I'm calling it, this is a romantic moment. And he 
is thrilled but concerned. He's like, she may still be stoned out of her mind. I can't, I can't do this without checking. So, um, so then her, her arch side, her, her snarky side, which we have seen often in earlier things, uh, comes up and, and he is like, no, just, are you still high? In other words, he's, he's being sincere. I am not, I am doing this because I want to. So she's giving him consent. Although if we keep discussing it, that will end. (laughs) Then this is her way of being, making sure that he understands, but also making sure that, you know, keep that finger on his lips. She does not want to talk. Okay. Okay. Um, this is not great. That's what I just want to say. Okay, this is uh, uh, sort of flat-footed, but I think it's okay. Leans in to kiss her, trying to rise up on one elbow, but failing because it is dead asleep. She frowns, struts to massage it. Oh man, I'm sorry, I was under you. It was under me. It was under me all night, wasn't it? Thank you. Ow, pins and needles. Okay. This is good. This is a good scene. Um, okay, yeah, we have we have successfully gotten through a bunch of scenes, and I think that that would be a good time to stop. Uh, cool and groovy. Um, it has been fabulous to have all of you here. It's great questions. I am happy to talk about those things. Uh, there we go. <laughs> uh, Cool. I will be back tomorrow to do more of the same. I hope you are all well, and I hope that you all, yeah, it's coming, go write something.